is Stigma, where we talk with leaders from many industries about how mental health and addiction have impacted their lives. Many people suffer silently from mental illness, addiction, depression, anxiety, and trauma. They never seek help because of stigma. In this podcast, host Stephen Hayes and his guests share their stories of recovery in order to encourage others to do the same. Here's Stephen. Welcome back to the Stigma Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Hayes. Today's guest, Jessica Carson, is the Director of Innovation at the American Psychological Association, where she leads the organization's effort around innovation and product strategy. She's somebody that I've been excited to speak with and record and share with you because my conversations with her regularly change how I see myself, change how I see the world. She's had an incredible set of diverse experiences from her role at the APA to being an expert in residence at Georgetown University. She was formerly a neuroscience and psychology research fellow at the National Institute of Health. She's been a director at Next Gen Venture Partners, and, and the list goes on. She recently published a book called Wired This Way on finding mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual well-being as a creator or, or said differently as an entrepreneur. The book's been called The Essential User's Manual for the Entrepreneurial Spirit. And two of my favorite humans on this planet contributed to this book, Andy Dunn, founder of Bonobos, who wrote the foreword of the book, and one of my dearest, closest advisors, mentors, and friends, Dr. Michael Freeman, wrote the afterword for this book. I have a lot of joy around getting to share this with you. This conversation is amazing. Without further ado, Jessica, thank you for coming on and doing this. Stephen, thank you so much. This conversation was a long time coming. It really, really was. And I normally like to start by introducing our guest to the audience and having the guest talk about bio background. And I think the right way to do that here is, is to sort of do it in the context of something you've written that really struck me. So I, I read on your personal website where you described how you were really originally drawn to the mental health space by your own desire to understand yourself. I'm fascinated by the statement because personally for me, it took a long time to get to the point where I was curious enough about myself to actually learn the truth and then do something about it. And I was, where did that start for you and how did that come about? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, it's such a, it's such a good question because, you know, we all teach best what we most need to learn. And at the end of the day, we're all just trying to figure our own selves out. And so, you know, I was always drawn to the fields of psychology and neuroscience because I was captivated by human behavior, but largely the behavior of those around me. And so when I started to work in venture capital, I was exposed for the first time to a whole mess of creators from entrepreneurs to investors, to corporate innovators, to creatives. And because of my background in psychology, I, I very quickly became fascinated by this duality that they seemed to possess, that on one hand, they possessed these extraordinary bright light qualities. They were ambitious and productive and intuitive and charismatic and open to experience and all these other wonderful qualities. But it also struck me that each and every one of their light qualities went hand in hand with an equal and opposite dark quality. So whether that was a mental health issue like depression and addiction, or it was arrogance, or it was distractibility, or what have you, I just became very fascinated by this idea that creators were this complex unity of opposites. And so I started to observe that in those around me. But Stephen, to answer your question about where I come into this, I too, as someone who's always identified as a creator, started to really struggle with my own mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual well-being. All of a sudden, my greatest, brightest, and most productive strengths started to self-combust and backfire because I was doing everything to an extreme. You know, my bright side all of a sudden turned into my dark side. And so I started to struggle with my mental health. I started to struggle with my physical health in the form of, for some unknown reason, on some not so special day, my hair just started to fall out. And I went to doctor after doctor and healer after healer, and no one could tell me what was wrong, except that I was a high potential young woman who was a little bit stressed. And so I went through quite a, a while of this, you know, dark night of the soul, if you will. And what emerged from it was a desire to understand 
the fact that I was both light and dark and that perhaps my light and dark qualities were not so far apart from each other, but were instead part of the same foundation of wholeness. And so that became the work that I then pursued and turned into my book, Wired This Way. So it has been an incredible journey of self-understanding, you know, followed by then teaching because you cannot take somebody somewhere that you have not been yourself. So when did you get the idea to sit down and write a book? That sounds like a a lot of work. (laughs) You know, the book, it's funny. I feel like when people are sort of blessed with a, a power piece, whether that's a book or that's a movie script or that's a company, it's almost like, it possesses them in a way. And I felt possessed by this book. It woke me up in the middle of the night. It decided when it wanted to come out and when it didn't want to play. And so the book, it wasn't really a conscious decision to write a book. It was being compelled to write it because in the process, I think, of expressing your truth, even in its most unflattering forms, you transmute it in a sense, right? You turn that negative into something quite beautiful and lovely. And I want to get into that because that's something you talk about in the book with respect to entrepreneurs and how their good moments and their bad moments are are characterized by others. So I want to get into that in a minute. But first, you had mentioned something that resonated with me that Dr. Michael Freeman had mentioned to me at some point, which is that a lot of these struggles and these strengths are kind of the same. They're one and the same as you write about it. It sounds really simple on the surface to me. Like that's a really, there's not a lot of big words in there. It's a short statement. I could, even I can understand it, but there's a lot to unpack. How can I, if I'm an entrepreneur or if I'm a creator, think about my strengths and my struggles are are one and the same? What does that even mean? Oh, such a good question. So Stephen, we can look at this from a a multitude of, of layers, but let's start by looking at it through the lens of mental health, because that's a large part of your work and my work and what this podcast is about. So you and I both know the dark side of conditions like depression or addiction or ADHD or bipolar. But what is not as often talked about is the absolutely invaluable and indispensable light side of these conditions as well. And that the truth might not be that creators are self-selecting into their work despite their mental health conditions, but because of their mental health conditions. Because, for example, when we look at somebody with depression, we can choose to see somebody who is uniquely capable of withdrawing from the world, slowing down their energy, and channeling their sort of ruminatory focus on uh, solving a problem of their choosing, like turning over and over a complex business problem. Or when we look at someone who's wired for addiction, we can choose to see someone who's wired for novelty seeking and sensation seeking and risk tolerance and passion and devotion and excitement and all of those absolutely mission critical qualities of the entrepreneurial spirit. And even when we look at things that might seem absolutely irrevocably bad, things like stress-related illness, we might be surprised to, to understand that researchers have found that those who are most prone to stress-related illness are those with high IQs. And the reason for this being, they have these permeable, receptive, sensitive, delicate nervous systems that are perceiving and receiving everything in their environment. And so, yes, at times their nervous systems are run raw by that constant state of noticing and stress-related illness might be a result. So those are some examples from uh, sort of looking at at, uh, mental health and physical health. But let's look at more sort of garden variety topics. So, you know, you take somebody who's, let's say, charismatic. Charisma is very much an essential quality of the entrepreneurial spirit. You know, no one would raise money if they didn't have charisma, you know, but the dark side of charisma is inauthenticity or manipulation or suppressing your feelings or, you know, wearing a mask or, you know, being whoever somebody needs you to be. And so the stronger the light, the stronger the ability to be charismatic, one could argue also the stronger the dark, you know, the the likelihood of 
faking it till you make it to an unproductive and unhealthy extent. You know, another example could be openness to experience, which is something that I like to think that I possess in spades. You know, I love new ideas, new people. I love complexity. I love richness. I love stimulating environments. I love learning new things, which is a really brilliant light quality. But the dark side of that means I am sort of equal and opposite in my tendency to be distracted, to have a hard time committing to things, to have a hard time focusing on things, to get bored too easily when things are too simple. So again, that light and dark are not two different or distinct things. They come from the very same foundation of being. And once the individual creator realizes that, it doesn't necessarily cure them in a sense because they never really needed to be cured. But what it instead offers them is this opportunity for radical self-acceptance because you realize that you were never actually broken to begin with, but that you're just wired this way. (laughs) Yeah, there's this concept that came up for me in the model that was used at my rehab center around the functional adult. And it's this idea that you were born in this natural state of perfect, perfectly whole, perfectly human, perfectly imperfect, perfectly vulnerable and strong all at the same time. And then over time, we learn like society convinces us of these imperfections that actually weren't there but then they, they, they become real in our mind. And Stephen, think about how this is magnified in the context of the entrepreneurial environment, right? Because you know, just as well as anyone, the nuanced culture of the entrepreneurial and investor ecosystem, where it is an ecosystem that is very much rooted in the masculine archetype of stoicism and aggression and competition and keep calm and carry on and keep the sturdy upper lip and, you know, boys don't cry kind of mentality. And again, I'm saying that whether you're a man or a woman, that is just kind of the mentality. And it's largely due to this dance that entrepreneurs have to do with their investors where you know you need to present this facade of brilliance and of brightness if you wish to continue receiving the resources you need to survive or thrive and if you're an individual who doesn't have investors you could say that that's the same thing for customers or that's the same thing in your relationship with your employees your ability to recruit top talent and so perhaps more so than any other profession out there entrepreneurs and their company are assessed as if they share the same lifeblood. And so the individual's mental, emotional, physical state is made equally, made equal, rightly or wrongly, to this, the health of their company. And so when there's something that is wrong, in air quotes, with the entrepreneur, the assumption can be made that there is something wrong, in air quotes, with the company, when in fact... That is very often not the case. Where does this cycle stop? And I think maybe a good way to answer that is, or to think about it is from the perspective of where it starts. I mean, I think about from where I sit in the ecosystem, I have investors. They want to know that giving me money to invest in companies is a good idea. So they want to hear how well the companies are doing. My founders know that I want to hear that. So they're giving me this, hey, I'm killing it vibe all the time. And then I'm taking that and turning around and giving it back to my investors who are then deciding whether or not they're going to invest in the next thing. And so we're all incentivized perversely to not be vulnerable with each other. And like, I wonder what would happen if we all just decided that we were going to share, like be vulnerable with each other. Could we still do business together? Like, would we just all go hide in a cave? Like what happens? How do we get out of this cycle of having to act like we're killing it all the time? Steven, you know, if I had the perfect answer to that, I would be a multi multi millionaire right now because you're right the incentive structure is effed up it's not structurally created for entrepreneurs to be humans and for investors to be friends or true mentors or however you want to conceptualize their role really the way that the ecosystem has been structured is that it's more like a judge and an Olympic athlete or, you know, a dancer on a stage and the audience. It's, there is no room or space for vulnerability or for failure, for falling on your butt, you know? And so it 
fundamentally demands that it actually really has to start with investors, that the investors start restructuring their relationship with their founders. So maybe instead of getting check-ins twice a year, four times a year, they're having more regular check-ins where it doesn't feel like there's as much pressure on the one meeting for everything to be going perfect and that issues and challenges can be surfaced and brought up as they occur. It might be investors subsidizing a certain amount of therapy or coaching. It might be in some way investors rewarding founders for their vulnerability and their honesty. There are a lot of different levers to play with, but Steve and I agree that I have not yet come across a lever that is sexy or rewarding enough for investors to really make the change other than just marketing and saying that they're founder friendly. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I don't want to be too negative, but I see a lot of investors out there saying they're going to look at me. I'm paying for my founders to go to therapy. It's like, I mean, okay, that's cute. But you get on the phone and create an environment for them, for them to be vulnerable and transparent with you, and then you reward them for that? Or do you just send them to therapy so they can do it over there? Like just paying for you to go to therapy almost might even be worse than just not doing it and creating the right environment over the phone to to be vulnerable together. Right. Well, and that's what is the quote. I think it's Carl Rogers that something to the effect of just watch how an individual grows when they have the permission to be themselves. Just watch how they grow when they are truly and fully accepted. And it is that psychological safety, ironically, in which we can be most creative, we can be most innovative, we can be most entrepreneurial. And so in a way, one could make the case that that inability to be vulnerable is actually hampering the speed with which entrepreneurs can unleash the wholeness of their expression, of their ambition, of their productivity. But that's a little bit of a harder case to put a dollar sign on. (laughs) Well, I think it's important and it brings up something for me that you wrote about how the media, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read what you wrote in the book, has breathlessly chronicled the peaks and valleys of today's creators, glorifying their strengths, villainizing their weaknesses, not realizing that the light and the dark within entrepreneurs are two sides of the same coin. Why are we there? Why do we treat the mistakes of these people as a car wreck on the highway? We all want to slow down and crane our neck at it and take a picture of it and tweet about it. We don't ever actually stop and think about how it's two sides of the same coin. And we, why why do we put these people in the penalty box when they make mistakes? Like, why don't we give people a chance? Because the entrepreneurs are the modern day gladiators in the lion ring. I mean, they are, they are doing something that most mere mortals, and I'm not saying this to glorify entrepreneurs because we're talking about how they, you know, certainly have their struggles, but they're doing something that I think all humans in some way or another admire and aspire to, which is to, you know, really self-actualize through the creation of something unique and new that is an extension of your own effort and energy and intention. That is ultimately what being an entrepreneur is. And so in a way, we marvel at their bravery, their willingness to go into this ring to do big, scary, daunting, damning things, but we're also humans. And so, you know, when the arm gets bitten off, we're, you know, we're sort of equally captivated, you know, and I think that there's certainly a ton of recent examples, whether it's examples where the entrepreneur really was in the wrong, like, uh, you know, an Elizabeth Holmes or, you know, that whole scandal with the, with fire festival, or it's something that's a little bit more, the line is fuzzy. Like for example, Adam Newman with WeWork. So if you look at, you know, now you can't even find press on him from a few years ago because Google's just so flooded with the recent, you know, recent results. But, you know, a few years ago, he was celebrated and praised as a gladiator, as a as an entrepreneurial god for his ambition and his, you know, ability to scale and his optimism and his vision. And those exact same light 
qualities when flipped on their head are why he's so ruthlessly criticized now. Because what was once hailed as his visionary tendencies is now slandered as his delusion. What was once praised as his ambition is now slandered as his greed or his manipulation. And so the truth is nothing really changed between Adam Newman a few years ago and Adam Newman today, except for the fact that something happened to the business, you know? And so now it's just, I do think it's part of human nature that we like a show. And we also have this fascinating fixation with pain and entrepreneurship, again, probably more so than any other profession offers the highest, highest highs and the truly guttural lows where the individual doesn't, you know, doesn't even know what they should do anymore. How do we do better here? I mean, how do we, where do we start to do better? I mean, wh- where do we draw the line at allowing people to have a second chance or to improve and then, and then try again? I mean, wh- do we just write people off? <laughs> well, I would say no. At the end of the day, you can't change all of society, but you can change or not so much change, but remember more of yourself. And so when everything else is out of your control, what you can alter your relationship with is yourself. And that might sound trite and that might sound boring and that might not sound like the answer that everybody wants to hear. But at the end of the day, the difference between those creators that are complex and they, they let that complexity burn them versus they are complex and they let that complexity fuel them, keep them going, seems to be their degree of self-understanding. So what I would say is, you know, well, I would say that all entrepreneurs need to read Wired This Way. I'm going to be launching over the next few weeks a virtual course as well that's really a journey of self-understanding for those on the hero's journey of being a creator, being an entrepreneur. And it's really coming to harness the light and the dark as a power source in the same way that, you know, I like to use the analogy of where energy comes from in the external world. So energy exists between proton and electron. It exists between high and low, anode, cathode, north pole, south pole. Energy exists in the opposites. So one could make the case that the more heterogeneous your personality, the more complex your personality, the more potential energy you possess as a human being. And so it's not a matter of simplifying yourself, but it's a matter of learning how to harness that complexity. And that comes first through going on a journey of self-understanding, then going on a journey of accepting what you've come to understand about yourself, and finally, figuring out how to leverage, how to express, and how to care for that complex wiring. So just like everyone else, wish there was an easy three-step cure, and psychologists and philosophers and spiritualists are of the same mind when they say that there is not. But it does start with the self. So there, there's obviously a process here. There's not a four-hour work week how-to book. God bless Tim Ferriss, but I don't think he has a book here that can tell you in a couple chapters how to fix yourself. But you know, one of the things in your book, you you have this piece that about where you write about my intention for you. It starts with this quote from from Carl Jung, who's been really influential in my life because of his his input into the AA program. Uh, His quote is that wholeness is not achieved by cutting off a portion of one's being, but by integration of the contraries. And that sounds heavy. And then after that, you talk about how following in the footsteps of countless creators who have transmuted their challenges into inspiration. And you go on to talk about how this book is a call to channel your potent energy into constructive, not destructive acts of creation. Okay, great. So that's complicated. That's probably, you can't even write a book to give you the answers. What is step one? I'm an entrepreneur. I'm sitting here today. Something you're saying is resonating with me. What action do I take right now to get onto the right path? Yes, I love it. If I could only tell people to do one thing, it would be to find some modality of self-inquiry or self-expression that is completely separated 
from your work. So let me give you some examples. When I was trying to figure the mess of myself out, and I say mess with love, I started uh, kind of instinctively doing things that I had never done before. And I found them to be not only healing, but truly informative of myself and what was happening inside of me. So I started picking up watercolors and I started sort of like obsessively creating Spotify playlists that like channeled a certain feeling that I was, I was feeling. I got really curious about the content of my dreams I got very curious about the meaning of symbols and the power of symbolism and how to use different symbols in my life. So these are a few of the myriad examples of tiny creative exercises that you do not have to be good at. I'm the world's worst watercolor, but I enjoy it because somehow through that process, through seeing what comes out on on the paper, I'm able to understand something about myself without filtering it, without inhibiting it, that I can then use to go another level deeper. And so, you know, for some individuals that may take the form of journaling, for others, meditation, for some breath work, for some yoga, for some painting, for some music, for some, you know, nature, but find something, anything really, that can be a mirror to the self. And once you kind of crack the surface you'll amaze yourself at how quickly you can get very, very deep. And I love the idea that the universe just is waiting for us to play with it. You know, it just wants us to engage with it. And it's amazing what happens once we really start engaging with these modalities of self-understanding. Because I promise you, I will give a free copy of the book to anyone who does this, and they don't find that immediately synchronicity start happening, books that they need start finding their way to them, people start finding their way to them, different sort of little uh, gems are put on their path that can help them go deeper and deeper and deeper. And whether that, you know, and and, uh, for many people that comes in the form of a mentor of some kind, whether that's a coach or a therapist, or I mean, forget about it. I've worked with all of them. I've worked with the shamans. I've worked with color healing practitioners. I've worked with XYZ people. And they're all different angled mirrors to see the self. And when you start doing that, you cannot help but grow. There's something you mentioned earlier, and I wanted to kind of dig in because I'm a nerd for the neuroscience. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. I don't have any. I have 45 days in rehab, so I have like some psycho enough psychoeducation to be absolutely dangerous and harmful, but I don't actually know anything. And so, when you talk about complex wiring, what's going on in my brain? What's the the layman's neuroscience explanation of of complex wiring? (sighs) What a cool question. Let me see the the easiest way to explain this. So individuals vary in their degree of what psychologists would call self-complexity. So self-complexity is defined by the amount of different aspects. And aspects is a technical term, aspects that we all contain. So, for example, some people who are lower in self-complexity will contain fewer aspects. They have a relatively simple way of defining and understanding themselves. And that's not to be judgmental because, frankly, it is those that are low in self-complexity that often have the sort of easiest go of it. You know, they don't struggle from the the mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual conditions as, as much as those high in self-complexity, which means they have a high number of self-aspects. So for example, I am feminine and I am masculine. I am open-minded and I am critically minded. I am creative and I am logical. I am a lover and I am a fighter. You know, that's, those are some sort of examples of that like inherent tension of the individual with high complexity. And the individuals who self-select into entrepreneurship tend to be those who are just full to the brim with nuance and contradiction and layers. And so, you know, from a neuroscience perspective, you know, this there's a lot to be said there. And, you know, it very much depends on the individual's genetics and wiring and pre-existing conditions. 
But when I talk about complexity, I'm referring to it more from the perspective of the number of layers on the onion, the number of words that you use to describe yourself to yourself. That's what it means to be complex. And my favorite psychologist, and I can say that because Carl Jung is my favorite psychiatrist, my favorite psychologist is a man named William James. And uh, James is no longer with us, but he described this in terms of once born souls and twice born souls. So it's a little bit, he used more sort of spiritual language, but once born souls are those among us who are happy. They're relatively easy to understand. They don't care much for the complexities and flaws and imperfections in themselves and the world around them. And as a result, they have pretty reasonable lives. But it's the twice born souls who are both what he called the six souls. They struggle from all of these challenges, but they're also those with most of a destiny. They are those who are most likely to use that complexity to create. And so it's about finding that pride and being the twice born that I find so exciting. So I know we don't have a ton of time. So there's something for my own personal development as an investor that I want to ask you, what is my responsibility as an investor, as an advisor, as a supporter, as a member of the startup ecosystem, what's my role in facilitating an environment where entrepreneurs can explore themselves and be free to create? Because at the end of the day, that actually is my fiduciary responsibility. If you really understand what you're telling me, my responsibility to my investors is to allow the space for my founders to create. How do I do that? Yeah, well, you know, Stephen, I think that you probably more so than just about any investor that I've ever met are are doing it. You know, you are practicing what you preach. And frankly, you're, you know, because of your own journey, you have an embodied understanding of what these individuals need to thrive. And so it's holding space for them to be imperfect. It's listening to them without immediately trying to fix them. It's providing them the tools and resources if they they need them, but otherwise giving the individual the freedom and space to be themselves and express themselves. And, you know, Stephen, I think that there's a lot that we can, you know, talk about for, in terms of creative ways of aligning incentives. But I think that if you had to boil it down to one thing that investors can do, it's acceptance true and honest acceptance. Something I need to work on. I think I probably I have to work on it with myself too. I probably can't accept my founders if I can't accept myself. So, I mean, it just goes back to what you're, what you're saying. I've got a lot of work I've got to do on myself to be able to create this space and do it right for, my, for the people I work with. Yeah. And that actually brings up a Jungian concept that I think is worth mentioning, which is the idea that we are most bothered by in others what we are most capable of or scared of in ourselves. So if you are, so said a little bit more simply, if you are someone who's listening to this and you're either an entrepreneur, an investor, or something else, the qualities that most irk you, annoy you, and scare you in others are those qualities that you need to examine more closely in yourself. So if you find yourself with a grudge, against people with a mental health condition or with a certain tendency or disposition, it's a very, very good hint that it's something that you need to work on in yourself first, because we can't really accept in others what we haven't really processed within our own being, which is uh, kind of the trick of this whole thing. (laughs) Maybe going back to the broader theme of this podcast, Maybe stigma while talking about it and promoting you know, the success that people have had while managing these di- mental health differences they live with, it starts with ourselves. I mean, maybe we need to destigmatize ourselves. Maybe we need to deal with ourselves first, and that's how we fight this. So destigmatization and acceptance could be interchanged here, but that's absolutely it. Because we can pretend, you know, all day long that we are on a quest to destigmatize mental health issues. But until we truly accept ourselves, flawed wiring and all, we will never really be able to accept the individuals that we are trying to hold space for. Well, look, this is awesome. What did I forget to ask? 
I always ask people that and I get a funny reaction, but I mean, seriously, I, I feel like I'm just some, you know, average Joe who's been through some stuff that's trafficking in the space, but I'm not a scientist. I don't know. I don't even know what to ask sometimes. What, what did I miss? Oh gosh. Okay. Well, if you can't tell, I'm pretty verbose. Uh, so I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to try to try to keep this short, but I would say to anyone listening, practice using your voice, practice, you know, when someone cracks the joke about somebody struggling with their mental health or somebody is quick to write someone off as, well, they're too arrogant or they're to this or they're to that, or, you know, you find yourself triggered by the way that an entrepreneur is presenting themselves on social media. Talk about it. Talk about it with others to talk through, you know, I'm curious where this is coming from, but also examine where it's coming from in yourself. And, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, share, this is an example for me. I find myself wildly triggered by a lot of entrepreneurs on social media because I say, you know, oh my gosh, they're so showy and they only talk about their accomplishments and like, can't they just like let their guard down? And the fact that I am so triggered by that means that that's really something I have to work on in myself because I know that I also have the ability to to come off that way as well. And so again, getting curious about what it is that bothers you and others and and using that as a starting jumping off point for self-inquiry. That's great. I'm taking notes, so <laughs> <laughs> I think you just I think you just scripted my next conversation with my therapist. Thank you. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> so, look, I, I know we don't have a ton of time left. So, a couple of housekeeping items. Where do you want people to go look for the book? Where's the right place to go find it? Amazon, Wired This Way, and you can follow me on Instagram, Jessica.m.carson. You can go to my website, JessicaCarson.co. And again, I will be starting to offer a virtual course over the next few weeks. So if this resonates and you'd like a little bit of structure and guidance around it, do let me know. How do I get in touch or where do I find the course? On my website. So you can uh, learn about it on my website and then you could also just email me and I'll share more. So I'll direct people to your website. That'll be linked in the show notes. This has been really educational. I've enjoyed it. I think the best conversations that I have on the podcast that I get to share with our listeners are ones where I'm genuinely learning as I go. And I, I, I appreciate that you're willing to come on and do that. And thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Stephen. I want to say another special thank you to Jessica for coming on and having this conversation with me. Honestly, this is one of those episodes where I'm going to have to go back and listen to it a couple times. I personally got a lot out of this. I hope that people listening got a lot out of this. And I hope that you'll connect with Jessica. We'll link to her, her stuff in the show notes. To our listeners, thank you for being here. And please, if you liked this conversation, if you like our content, we'd love it if you'd hook us up with a subscribe or a like or a review on your podcast platform of choice. Would love it if you'd share us with a friend. If you'd like to support us in the content we create, you can find us on Patreon as well. We'll provide a link to that in the show notes. To the founders out there, don't forget to join the Mental Health Startup Slack community, which you can also find linked in the show notes. And we have a new segment that we launched recently called the Founder Spotlight, where we create an episode out of five three-minute pitches from founders in the mental health space. Nothing's filtered, nothing's edited. But our intent is to leverage our platform to bring more awareness to entrepreneurs who are building in the mental health space. Most importantly, we want to hear from you. Please do comment on social media and let us know what you liked or what you want to hear more of or what you didn't like. And you can reach out to us on Twitter at StigmaCast. You can find us on Instagram at Stigma Podcast, And you can email us info at stigmapodcast.com anytime. Either my wife or I will answer your email. And you can find us on our website at stigmapodcast.com. Thank you again for being here. And that's it. Until next time, stay safe, be well, and thank you so much for your support. Mm-hmm.